this search for knowledge, for understanding, as I said, is good, is about repetition, but it's also good to understand and accept that at each moment not all answers are needed. In that way I can say, for example, that nowadays I have this teacher in Nepal since five years who is teaching me quite new things, of which I actually know Harish Johari could have taught them to me also because he also had that knowledge. But he didn't. He didn't even mention it. Only through some other people and some things I see in his books, I just see, yeah, but he has this knowledge. Why did he never bring it to me? Well, quite simply because it was not yet the time. I first needed to learn some other things before I was ready for that. And so then now, okay, I have another teacher, I get some more of that, and I have again something more uh, to work with. So that is also important. Uh, yeah, there are so many things. No? Once, especially with this, no? as I said, to go inside, you only need one thing. So a little zapping around to find that which suits you best, and then you find it, and okay, that's from, you know, that moment onwards what you will do, to go inside. But to bring outside that peace, that bliss, that love, that power also, that energy, that is endless, that is magical, miraculous, and then there's so much to learn, that it's like unbelievable. I feel myself totally ignorant still in that level. You know, like I've only learned a small fraction of that. But some of the people I've seen in India, I understand. Yeah, they are playing on a very different level. You know? So, uh, okay, Monday maybe also I'll get there. You know? But so that means today I'm still ignorant. To accept that you are ignorant is very good. Then you can learn. And to accept that not everything needs to be learned right now is also good. In a way you can say that learning happens in a spiral motion. So that means that at some point you kind of reach something and then you feel, oh, okay, now I'm okay. Like because of what you learned before and you reach a certain balance and you know, you're okay. And maybe for one day you're okay, or for one week you're okay, or one month you're okay, or even one year you're okay. And then suddenly something will happen and you say, no, I'm no longer okay. And it doesn't mean you've lost that which, you know, you've learned. It just means you reached another level. There's something more to learn. A new problem has come up. I also explain that in relationship to the subconscious mind. If everything which is in your subconscious mind would come out in just one moment, you know, we would explode. You would go crazy. It's quite impossible. Mm -hmm. So, the things that are now, like, let's say, bothering you, certain feelings or whatever that are bothering you, they are the things that are at this moment coming out of your subconscious mind. And so then you can learn to deal with them, to accept them, to kind of work around them, find a solution, and let go. And then you'll feel a little relief for a while. And then something else comes like to the surface and says, well, and what about me? And then you say, oh, this is new. So I have again to find a solution, again to work with something. So that was what I mean with learning in spirals. Like every time you make a circle in the spiral, you kind of reach a new level, but it's, it's quite endless. No? There's always something new coming, coming up. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that is endless because at some point, sure, the subconscious is really pure and the self can shine through without any ob obstruction. And that is when, you know, we, we say the person is enlightened. But we talked about that already. It's a little tricky concept in, in its own way also. Now, another subject which is here um, is that if you are on your own, but you do have some sort of a connection with a teacher or with more teachers, then this faith that you have 
in the teacher. This love that you have for the teacher is also very helpful. I already said before, it is helpful because it gives you confidence. No? But it goes quite a bit beyond that. No? And it can be a little bit confusing, let me first say that, it can be a little bit confusing to feel love for the teacher, but it comes very naturally. At some point I was feeling so much love for Harish Johari, I started doubting if I was gay or something. You know? <laughs> like, I just wanted to be with him. I even, you know, like, wanted to. He was just so nice, and so great, and so powerful, and so knowledge, and, you know, this, this is how I felt. And I really thought, you know, what's happening to me? You know, I'm changing or something, you know. But this is a different kind of love. This is not the kind of love, you know, between a man and a woman, or two men or two women. This is a different kind of love between a student and a teacher. And it is good also a little bit to understand it so that you can work with it. Because for many people this is again an obstruction. Uh, this love, as I said, it can be confusing. If you, you know, if it is a woman like uh, uh, falling in love with a man uh, who is the teacher, or the other way around, or whatever, you know, uh, yeah, it can be confusing because maybe the teacher is not interested no? in that way. No, he's interested in, in this love as a teacher, but not as a person, not as an individual. Because the teacher truly is not an individual. The moment he starts teaching, he is no longer an individual. There may still be some of his character there, still some of his history there, sure, that comes out, you know, in his language, in all these things. But truly, a teacher is no longer an individual. So that which is loved at that moment is not the person. It is the teachings. You take away these teachings from the teacher, and the love is gone. Then just an ordinary person is there. Then maybe he, you know, he's too small or too thick or you know, too old, too young, whatever, you know. Then you look differently. But he can look any way or she can look in any way that you would normally not at all find attractive. But because the teaching is there, you feel very attracted. So this can be a little bit confusing, but you just, you know, set that aside, understand it, and say, no, no, this is just a different kind of love, and a love which can be very strong and can be, as I said, very, very helpful, because there is a kind of, uh, how would I say, surrender in that love. Always in love there is a kind of surrender. And through this surrender you can learn so much more easily, you can understand so much more easily, and then whenever you are not with the teacher, this love will keep you in contact with the teachings. Because when then you miss this teacher, you will at some point understand that the only way to get rid of that feeling, which can be really strong, like in a normal love, if your lover is gone for half a year, yeah, you miss this love. So the same way you miss the teacher. But that also brings in you a great power. Because then you realize that the only way to kind of get rid of this feeling of missing the teacher is to become like the teacher. To, you know, have this same quality that he has or she has. And in that way it can be a very great power. And especially for me, after Harish Johari left his body, the first week or so I felt like devastated, I felt I lost like my dad or something, or, or at least somebody very important. And then I kind of could come out of that by understanding this very profoundly, that that which I was missing was not the man. It was really the teacher. And that the only way that I could bring him back was to become like him. And that is when I, in a way, really started practicing. I mean, I'd been doing a lot of practice already, but still that kind of made a big change. So this love can be very powerful, and also, as I said, in a very magical way. Because we are really all connected in the, let's say, common mind field. And uh, I talked about that more in the class on, uh, on Tantra, but If there is a, a 
love relationship between student and teacher, then that connection is much more strong. Anyhow, if there is some kind of connection, then there is a connection. So in the common mind field, there can be kind of a help. But if the love is there, the help can be so much more because the love permits the help. And to understand properly how this works, I have to maybe give a few examples. Like, some people, for example, they see my class on YouTube and then they feel, oh, I, I have so many questions, I want to write some letter or message in, in Facebook. And then they start writing and asking the questions and then they feel they already have the answer. And then again they delete it and they're like, hmm. And then, oh, this question. And then they come, this question, and they ask and they don't finish it because they already get the answer. And I have no idea that this is happening, but people are telling me this quite frequently. So you have to understand what I'm saying now about the common mind field as something in which the teacher is not personally involved. Like I've also explained that whenever I start the class, I ask Ganeshji for some help to remove all obstacles, no? like it's common in India. And I also ask my teachers to help me, and actually I ask them just teach through me. Yeah. So that me, myself, as a person, I have nothing to do with it. I don't feel restrained or shy or anything. It's just happening. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying there is not that this is happening in any conscious way, that let's say the soul of Harish Johari is hearing me asking this question and is you know, like looking over my shoulder and whispering things in my ear. Now you have to say this, now you have to say that. It's not working like that. You know. It is working like subconsciously because in the subconscious we are all linked this also has many other stories but we are all linked in the subconscious mind and through this link the teaching can happen and so in that way whenever you are alone without the teacher and uh, feeling that you have a question maybe you are in a difficult situation and you really have no idea what to do with it and you need an answer, but the teacher you cannot reach, or you cannot reach anybody whom you feel can give you this answer. Then the thing to do is to go to silence, and then picture the teacher in your mind, and ask the question, and again go to silence. And then the first thing that will come will be the answer. And this works very, very well, if the love is there. If the love is not there, it can still work. If you feel, oh, he's not a bad teacher, but I don't really feel like anything particular here, but okay, then it can still work. But it will work more easily, much better, if um, the love is there, and uh, it will then also work even without you asking. And I've had many of these experiences with Harish Johari and other teachers that I felt that I was getting some help, that suddenly some understanding or some opportunity or something came. And yeah, I realized that this came through them. And not because I particularly asked for it, but just because there is a link, there is a love, there is a permission. On the subconscious mind, on the level of the subconscious mind, we are very aware of how karma works. And the main thing that one can never do if he wants to avoid bad karma is to do anything against anybody's will. So if a person wants to remain unhappy and is not asking for any help, then the teacher will not give any help, will not really give any advice, because that person has the right to, to remain unhappy. Only if the question comes, oh, please help me, I feel sad, what should I do? Then the teacher can help. So also on the subconscious level, this is true, and even much more so. On the subconscious level, the soul of Harish Johari and many other teachers, they are there for me. They will help me because my love allows it. If that love would not be there, they would be a lot more like restrained in... in what kind of interference that they can, they can give. And uh, 
that then of course also connects to the spiritual world in the sense of the other souls and beings that are there and that can also be themselves students belonging to the same lineage or can be themselves teachers no? and they can then also be part of this game part of this help it's mysterious how all this works but certainly also the spirit world has some role there uh, to play and in that way again to have some sort of practice even if it's just one minute a day where you say oh please all the good energies around me please help me to learn and to grow and to become a better person that is giving them the permission and as I say you have to believe these things it's hard I resisted it for like very long time until I thought okay let's just try and started doing these things and then see yeah things much more rapidly kind of happen and come and how is there there are many stories like that also in the Vedas like there are many stories in the Vedas or in other old scriptures where there is somebody who wants to be the student of a teacher but the teacher refuses teacher has a right to refuse for whatever reason maybe it's a stupid reason like he believes so oh, this person is of the low caste for example this would happen in the stories and then this person was not allowed to be a student only Brahmins were allowed to be students for example or uh, maybe the teacher said I don't want any students I have you know enough trouble on my own <laughs> or I only want one student or whatever you know so these things are there and so then in many of these stories you will find that there is a student who is like still very much wanting to learn from this teacher that he says well you don't want me I don't care but anyhow I am becoming your student and they usually then like have a picture or something of this teacher and they worship this picture and they ask this picture to help and then there are actually many stories in which these people evolve miraculously and become great whatever you know maybe archers also there's a story like that in the Mahabharata uh, warriors or uh, yogis or, or whatever even though they have not had the teachings somehow it came to them because they had the love and the devotion and the permission was asked please teach me and this was very real and true and even though the teacher did not want to do it with his conscious mind subconsciously he had no choice as I said before the teacher is not the one who decides what is being said or what kind of teaching is given this comes automatically this comes naturally this comes from somewhere else this does not come from a person this comes from a common understanding which is there in the common mind field so if a student really is there and says oh I want to learn then it, it will happen even if the teacher is not agreeing to teach and I can tell another story of my own life there is that uh, one day I uh, was teaching in Shivananda Shram in the Bahamas and uh, Shivananda is one of the great teachers of the past century but I never met him and I never really read anything that he'd written or anything I didn't really have any connection with him but these people asked me to come and teach in the Bahamas so I thought okay why not nice holiday and I went there and I was teaching and so I was there for like uh, 10 days and in the end of my journey there I had to wait for the boat because actually this is on an island so I had to wait for the boat to bring me from the island to the airport and uh, near the place where the boat comes there's this little house so I sit in this house and in this house there was a picture of Shivanam and uh, so yeah somehow I was just waiting I was just staring at this picture and I had a kind of experience I can't really say what it meant or what was happening because I don't really remember but the one thing which happened is that from that time on from the moment when I stepped into the boat until I landed in Brussels 
I was in one of the most spiritual states I've ever been. I was completely like hmm, quite unaware of whatever was happening around me, still functioning quite naturally, but somehow totally in bliss. I was making connections with all kinds of people. It was very strange. I don't remember a lot of it, but I remember it was quite something. And one of the most, let's say, egoless states in the waking state that I've ever experienced. And I'm sure it came from him. And it came from him because I was there, I saw his picture, maybe I was impressed, maybe I said, oh, thank you for, you know, something like that I did. I said, you know, thank you for letting me teach here and, you know, for helping me and I'll be back or something. I don't know, but it happened. And, and for more than 12 hours I was completely in a state of bliss and uh, actually missed my plane also. <laughs> But that was all not a problem. <laughs> like, uh, in, uh, first had to fly to America, Atlanta, I think. And then in Atlanta I had a, to have a connection and I had a few hours to get this connection so there was really no problem. But somehow I missed it because I was way out. But then they somehow still found another plane and got me here. You know, it's like quite a miraculous uh, thing, but I'll always remember it. And since that time, I have a connection with Shivananda, even though I've never met him. I still haven't read any of his books. I actually, for the moment, don't really read books. So, but I still feel this connection and I have his picture. <laughs> and I say hello on a regular basis. So that you can do, and that I do also with Ramana Maharishi, whose books have really been like such a great help and with Nisargadatta Maharaj. They are all in my meditation room and I say hello to them every day. So this is really part of what you've gotten yourself into. This is really a learning and it all depends on what permission are you giving. And this permission you don't have to like sign a document or anything. The only thing you have to do is love. To love the teacher because of the teachings that he is representing. Not because of the person that he is, because I don't know these people. I never met them. But I can love them because of the teachings that they represent. So, one says that the teaching tradition is Sanatan Dharma. Mm -hmm. Sanatan Dharma is the eternal original, universal teaching lineage. This is another name actually for the word Hinduism, but a much older name and a much more true name because the word Hinduism is linking the whole thing to the Indus Valley and that is just something outsiders did. But from the point of view of the Hindus, they are not actually Hindus, they are Sanatandar, they are universal, original, eternal ever adapting, ever changing, and always the same. So that is what you are part of, and the moment you open up to it, you will get help. Even if you are standing uh, on an, on an uh, uninhabited island somehow, it does not matter. You will always get the help. All you need to do is love the teachings, open your mind, not resist it, and whatever you get, you try to practice. In life, on your yoga mat, or whatever. That is how you can really be your own teacher, even though that is becoming like a little bit a strange way to, to look at it now. The idea, am I a teacher, am I a student, are only of the ego. They are I, completely irrelevant in the whole story. Sometimes somebody acts as a teacher, Sometimes somebody acts as a student, that is all. That is what is called the student-teacher lila, no? the guru lila. And it is just a play, just something happening. But, you know, it's nothing real. It's nothing to do with the personalities. We are already all where we have to be. We only don't really realize it. And that's the only little game that we are playing here, and that you can play in your life, 
so that you can be more happy whatever happens. And it's still your choice. You don't have to be happy whatever happens. But if that is what you like, then that you can get just by opening up. It's really that easy. So, I don't know if there's any questions on that story. I had to teach up. <coughs> um, but I didn't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Because I didn't trust him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I it would have been very hopeful for me if he had made the first step to say to me, I see this and this happening. Mm. Be attentive or intent on that, on that. So, but now it was a cycle of a cycle. I couldn't trust him. Mm. But, and now you say you have to love the teacher. But I, I did really. I, I did. Because, because of his personality, there was a narcissist, there was a, a, a narcissist. Yeah, yeah. Else, uh, really, um, I'm not saying you have to love everybody who believes he is a teacher. Because, as you say, he is a narcissist. That is nobody who can teach you. Because the understanding, the true knowledge, only comes to the one who at least temporarily can drop the ego. Who at least temporarily can forget who he is. Who at least temporarily can forget his name even. Then the teaching can come. Mm-hmm. So, enlightenment is no requirement, but a little bit of that must be there. So if you say he's like a very ego-centered person, mm-hmm. even if he has acquired some knowledge, some techniques, some mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. Maybe he can stand on his head for three hours. That just <laughs> requires willpower. Mm-hmm. And, and okay, it will give him some practical knowledge, but for the rest, not much can be gained from, from that person. And it may be indeed quite dangerous to like love this person or yeah. get very attached to this person because a love connection is, is very strong and is not easily cut. Once you create it, it takes time to again you know, be removed, uh, which is also why, like, if you've been in a love story and it ends, that for a long time you still feel, like, you know, connected, because you are. Only slowly, slowly that connection goes. So in that way, sure, you know, as I said, the best thing to do when you are with a new teacher and you kind of don't know if you can trust them, is close your eyes, try to meditate. If you feel it's working better than at home, then you have found something. If it's not working better than at home, what's the use? If it's worse than at home, (laughs) sure, you don't need to stay, right? Because the practical knowledge is very little important. Mm -hmm. And to get that, you don't need to love. You only need to pay. That's all. In a way, I mean, when people ask me sometimes why I give these teachings for free, because it's nothing very special, but it's also not so common. I have my own personal reasons. Like, I don't want to make things complicated. It just makes it easy. Whoever is there is fine. I don't have to think about it. And I can make my money in a different way. I find that more easy. So that is my personal reason. But apart from that, I feel that only in this way I can really let this flow happen. Like I feel if I would be in a different relationship here, like you are clients or something, it, it, I, it wouldn't work for, the same, for me in the same way. So in that way, it's also relating to that. And I'm not saying that this is true for everybody who is asking money because, you know, there's so many teachers who really, yeah, have made a living out of it and and, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand. But I started teaching 
in an ashram in India because I was told to by one of my teachers or two and uh, this was you know freely happening there was no money involved or anything and I very much enjoyed it and since that time I always felt hmm, if I turn this into like a profession I'll lose it somehow and that's why I have not done it so but it's just one part of it you know? um, narcissistic you know? we all are narcissistic in a little bit but there's limits. Any more uh, questions? Is I mean, there's many reasons why they are saying that. I mean, if I would be uh, making a profession out of it, I probably also would say my way is the best way. It's, you know. This is not the only reason. Um, they also really believe in it, usually. And uh, that is because that is the way they have followed. But the truth is, of course, different. You know? There is no best way. That is true for everybody. For everybody it's personal. It's like we all want to reach the same goal. You know? And in that way you might think there is a best way to reach this goal. But this goal is not in any particular place. You know? It's in, in here. And uh, the problem is we're all coming like from a different way from a different direction, from a different place, to that place. So we all kind of need different techniques. Like this has been very well explained, and actually anybody who knows the basics of the yoga philosophy and the Vedas will never say this yoga is the best yoga. This is completely against the teachings, because in the teaching is very clearly explained that for a person who is more emotional driven, then you have bhakti, chanting mantra, bhajan, puja, all these things, uh, helping others, hugging, you know, you know it's, this is what works. And then for people who are more intellectual, more thinking, there is jhana yoga, there's a lot of like uh, reasoning and, you know, reasoning the ego away. Huh? This is jhana yoga. And then for people who are like more active, wanting to do something, then there is physical uh, practice, and there is um, karma yoga, no? trying to help other people and getting rid of the ego in that way. No? Um, so that is very well described and what is also very well described is that this is of course not like people can be put in one of those three categories, but we all have a mixture of these three things, so we find our own mixture of the yogas that, that respond to that. And that we usually then find in a particular tradition, which has a mixture which kind of, you know, suits us. Um, it's also true that these three things are the three things that we can do. Like we can only think or feel or act. And so when we think, we try to think the truth, jhana yoga. When we feel, we try to feel love, bhakti yoga. When we act, we try to act in selfless service, karma yoga. So uh, in that way, for all, it is, it is there, but in different mixtures, you know, in different recipe, like. Um, but what I said about you only need one technique to reach samadhi is very important. Very important. I mean, we can look in Ashtanga Yoga and there we get like eight steps. And sure, that also works. I'm not saying it's wrong. But you don't need the eight steps. Just one. And just stick to that one. And it's only because that is very difficult that, you know, there's a sequence created to make it more easy. You move from here to there and then from there to there and from there to there. But actually, you don't need to do that. 
just for example the mantra or just stopping breath will be enough. You stop breath long enough, you have to disappear. You know? <laughs> no way around it. But it's very hard to do that. So that is why usually what we teach people is this gliding motion, this slowly, slowly sinking into meditation where first you make it a little bit more attractive for mind. So mind gets engaged, mind already gets a little bit more like calm and benefit and harmony and then slowly, slowly you come to that point where you are only focused on one thing and then you stay on that one thing. So that one thing is actually all you need. If you have enough faith, conviction, willpower, then you just take that, you stay there, Om Namah Shivaya, for 20 hours, and you'll be in Samadhi. No? So, uh, it's good to a little bit look around, but there's no need to try out everything. Because it's, one might say that there is a yoga like for every yogi. That is one of those expressions, but that does not mean you have to go and find it. You can also just find something which feels kind of okay and then go for it because that will do it. Like just imagine in the old days, people couldn't travel with airplanes, you know, around the globe. Even traveling 20 kilometers was difficult and some people would never travel more than 50 kilometers in their life. No? So then if one teacher was only there in the village and he was teaching mantra yoga, then everybody would use mantra yoga. And some people would find that more easy, some might find it more difficult, but all would succeed. Same if there would be a teacher that only teaches pranayama, or even pranayama asana combination in hatha. Then that would be there, so that was what you, you know, could learn. I was very lucky, no? because at the time when I met Harish Johari, there was not many other teachers. No? And he was such a multidisciplinary guy, no? wrote many different books, really could master so many different things and knew so many different techniques. So from him I could learn so many different things and then pick what would work for me at a particular time. That was quite exceptional. Very often you will find a teacher, he has only one particular technique or maybe a few steps and that is what he teaches. But these days there's Unfortunately, too much marketing involved in the whole story, and you have to be aware of that. And there's only one person who can decide what is the best yoga, and that is you. If you feel attracted, you try it out. If it works, okay. If it doesn't, okay. You don't have to get like stuck. There's no value I can, I can call teacher. Mm. 
And at a certain moment, I, I said to myself uh, that, uh, okay, uh, is there is no other, other teacher, I have to completely turn into myself. And, uh, and then my, my, myself a teacher and use my, my own wisdom. Uh, but in the sense, like, you also said that if I come here, I, I feel unhappy. And I was like, hmm, I didn't come here because I feel unhappy. It's quite otherwise, I feel happy, so I come here. But anyways, in anyhow, it's really confusing for me, this teacher. Mm. Yeah. It, and isn't, isn't it like, um, like expectation? And this assumption that we need a teacher, the outer teacher, I mean, because mm. the inner teacher, I completely understand this mm. concept. It's very close to my heart. Mm. But is this is like this assumption that we need a teacher to, to progress, to grow, to, 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 to learn? Yeah. There's different aspects to your question, actually. No? Um, first of all, there's no saying that you need a teacher. No? As I explained, in many traditions, there are many teachers. No? Some traditions, there's only one teacher. In other traditions, one person will have many teachers. And in that way, even the tree, the flower, I mean, you know, anything can be in your teacher and you can learn. The moment that you have this attitude of learning, the moment that you look at a person, at at a teacher or at a tree as something from which you can, you know, that you open, that you don't immediately start with your own stories, you know, that you open there. So this is the one thing. Now, this love connection that you say that you've never felt to any teacher, you know, this may have different reasons also, and I cannot say. But one reason that might be there is that you already have such a love connection with the teacher, but he's no more there. That is quite possible, quite he's common. No more, no more there. Yes, that in a other life, past life, you had such a connection, and this is very strong connection, and in so such a way that it has become a little bit exclusive. And. I would say that is probably why you have not felt, because I have the feeling you have seen many teachers, you have traveled, you have seen many people who really are quite spiritually evolved beings. If you do not feel such a attraction to them, it's probably because your heart is already somewhere else. Like if a man truly loves his wife, then anybody can walk by, he will not feel any attraction, because his connection is made. You know? Same way it can happen with a teacher. So this is one possibility, I cannot say if it is true, but definitely this is one possibility. If you yourself feel that you really have been open enough, egoless enough in front of any teacher that you have uh, met, if you feel that you really have done that, then the reason why it didn't happen is probably because there is already a connection and it is so strong and it is helping you and that way you are learning. You know? So, you should not feel that what the others are saying, oh, you do need a teacher or something, is uh, bothering you. No? Uh, as long as you do not feel this connection, what can you do? Well, I'm not saying anybody here that, you know, you have to go out and as fast as possible find some guru and throw yourself at their feet whether they, you know, you, you feel it, it got attraction or not. No? no, this attraction should be there anyhow, otherwise you will not do it. But at some point it happens, you do it. And maybe it's because of the lineage no, to which I belong through Harish Johari that after he left, I found it very easy to kind of recognize him or what he represents in many other teachers, and I very easily bowed out to them and accept them completely and love them completely. But uh, we are all different, so I cannot, I cannot say. Um, 
the other thing that I said about unhappiness, <laughs> uh, don't take it wrong, is uh, again basic yoga understanding, the bhumikas, the seven steps towards enlightenment. The first one is unhappiness and trying to find a solution. And that is not meaning that you have come here all sad or anything like that, you know. <laughs> Maybe you came here dancing and so on. But still, the reason why we are involved is somehow to solve this problem of the ego, of unhappiness, you know, always seeming to come after happiness, in, you know, like the rain comes after the sun. And we kind of want to stop that. So that's all I was uh, saying uh, on, on that. But so, to be open is the only requirement. Not to force anything or feel like anything should be there. And as long as you don't feel like that, okay, you know, there's anyhow many great people out there, many great books there, many great experiences that you can have in your own practice so that you can anyhow move forward. But uh, if the opening is there, the teaching is there. That's the only requirement. No person is needed. No teacher in the form of a person is needed. But is also well, very helpful. So that's that the only question you have to ask yourself. Am I blocking it? Am I just not opening up? Or is that not the case? And am I really quite open and really like listening? But it does not happen. Okay, it doesn't happen. Some reason is there. It will come. It will come back. Somewhere. For most people who regularly come to my classes, these classes may be a little bit less needed. Although everybody also, you know, in their own life, they are alone at home. But I really wanted to make it for the people who watch on YouTube, because they have not so much, you know, possibility to meet me or ask me questions or anything. So in that way they get a little bit idea how to deal with it. And uh, it does not really matter so much which teacher you find. I'm sure in any part of the world there are so many good teachers who can really help you on the essential level. Even maybe they don't have a lot of like knowledge or cannot give long talks like I'm quite capable of, but it's not that which is so important. It is on the energy level, it is on the feeling level. Like my grandmother, she did not really have such a big knowledge, but she had the essence. I'm already there as a child, I learned so much from her. So in that way, it's about opening up and having faith and acceptance and loving the teachings. 